On today's episode, the San Diego Padres may have a day off, but that does not mean we aren't potting because class, folks, is still in session. We are giving out letter grades, a report card for the San Diego Padres offensive players, position players to start the 2024 season. Some good, some bad, some a little bit in between, but a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Padres Podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Thursday, April 11th. April 11th. And some might call it, hold on. Is that 311? No, that was last month. Whatever. I like 311 the band. As always, I'm your host with subtitles occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You may be familiar with some of my baseball-related work over at Just Baseball, where I not only write about the Padres, but also general baseball. It is a fantastic website, and you can also check out my podcast, Baseball vs. the World, in which I do other baseball culture stuff. Just fun, fun little episodes on all things baseball culture. Go check that out. We've got some interviews and whatnot, as well as some ridiculous predictions for the 2024 season. Check me out on Twitter, like I said, at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. If you want some questions answered, you can leave them in the comments. Why is Pac-Man still here? We want you to replace him. Whatever you want, we'll talk about it. Today's episode, guys, we're doing a report card on Padres offensive players. We will be saving the defensive and no, not defensive, the pitching side of this for tomorrow. Uh, that is what we're going to do. We're going to split this in half because of the off day. Since we don't have any games to recap, that's what we will be doing. And today is probably the more fun one, if we're being honest with uh, each other, is that we're, we're talking about all the offensive players for the Padres. And look, it's been like in, ter- in terms of like individual players, it's been good, right? Like the, the Padres have played very well so far and – I will say that I only have one player that I've given my illustrious A plus grade to, and we're going to talk about him first. But, you know, for the most part, like individually, a lot of the Padres players haven't been too bad um, in a lot of ways. They've just as a team been really inconsistent, right? Offense that explodes some days, then it goes quiet the next. We just had that this week with the big comeback eight run win. And then you follow that up by getting sliced and diced by a pitcher who's not all that effective and only scoring one run the very next day. And it's an Eggy Rosario, like garbage time home run. Right. So it's, it's just been inconsistent, but in like in self-contained spurts, players have actually looked pretty good on this Padres team. And there is no other player in my opinion. And this includes pitchers and batters. The only player that I'm giving an a plus to, and I don't like giving A-pluses because it suggests perfection, and there's no perfection, right, especially in such a small sample size. But that is Jake Cronenworth, ladies and gentlemen. It is very, you know, I've talked about him on this podcast a lot. Um, I think youth is something to expect. But he gets an A-plus for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think that the n- number one thing that needs to be remembered is that not too long ago we were talking about, like, oh, my gosh, this Cronenworth contract is a disaster. Now, even though he has been good, I still stand by my take there because my take there was, look, You've got Juan Soto. Why are you handing out all this money? And especially for Cronenworth, who were you bidding against exactly? All of his trajectories and everything were actually going down every year offensively. So it just felt like, why do you want to do that now? Shouldn't you wait a little bit before you extend this guy? You've got a couple more years in arbitration. But at this very moment, and again, it does not change my opinion in the contract, Jake Cronenworth might be a bargain at this right now. I don't think he's going to continue hitting like this. But so far through the season, he has just been... Phenomenal. He currently leads. He's tied for the lead in F4 uh, for the Padres. He's got a 144 WRC+, plus, which is outstanding, which is the second best of any kind of regular starter on the team. Technically, it's third if you're counting Eggy Rosario, who for some reason has a 206 WRC+, plus, which is pretty wild. Um, and then Jerick Saprofar, who has a 181, uh, who's been a little bit uh, better, I think, in a lot of ways than people expected, just just a tiny bit better. But for me, Cronenworth, the reason why is because if you dig deeper into his numbers, everything is a lot more exciting about Jay Cronenworth. This doesn't just look like his 2021 season. It looks like his 2020 season when he looked like one of the best second basemen in baseball. But the problem is that it was a short you know, period. But even still, he was outrageous. Go pull up the Savant sliders. That man had bleeding red everywhere. And that's what he's been like so far in 2024. The only thing that he struggled in a little bit so far 
is his walk rate. That is one thing that he's usually been good at, even when he hasn't been hitting, is that he's walked a decent amount. Not as much this year. He's in the 29th percentile in terms of walk rate. And in terms of his career average, he's at 6.3%, and he's at been at 8.8, 10 8.2, 8.6, 9.4% before. So it has gone down. But he has out... He has absolutely outdone himself because of how well he's hitting. His hard hit rate has spiked by 12% this year. That's how good he's in. In terms of barrels, he's now tied for first in Major League Baseball in total barrels with eight in 2024. Do you know who the only other players that are right next to him are? Shohei Otani, who just made news recently by the time you're watching this, and Jordan Alvarez. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, that's who, in terms of barrels, the only other players that are on the same level as him. And he's like I said, he's the only player that I'm giving a plus to. And I think that another part of this that's really worth uh, pointing out is that he's actually there's two things. Actually, there's so many things to talk about with Cronenworth. That's probably going to be the entire segment uh, for a second. We just need to uh, praise Cronenworth that um, in terms of his batting, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of his batting, that he has actually been a little bit unlucky. Right. If you look at his his his. Um, let me see if I can find it right here. Where's his Babbitt? Let me see if I can find his Babbitt. Not his Babbitt, I'm sorry. His weighted on base and his expected weighted on base, even with everything that he's hitting right now, even the fact that he's currently slashing 304, 365, 518, he's actually also been getting unlucky. His current weighted on base is three, uh, 385, which is excellent. And his expected weighted on base is 435. That's like a 60-point difference. And don't get me wrong. That's a massive difference because if you have, like, one or two games of getting unlucky, everything's going to spike. Like, if if Machado has two home runs tomorrow, then all of a sudden, like, his stats will just change completely, right? Don't get me wrong. But it just shows you he's also been getting a little bit unlucky. So, Cronenworth, like, I don't know if he's about to have, like, his career season, right? Like, I don't know if he's about to become one of those top five second base players. That's what he was before. I don't think he can do that at first necessarily, but I will say also grading out as a good defender with three outs above average. He's looked pretty sharp there. The only maybe mistake he made was that failed double play uh, with Kim in the San Francisco series where maybe he should have thrown it to Kim first rather than checking first base. But otherwise, he's graded out well there because he scooped a whole lot of bad throws. And he he throws himself off the bag. He looks excellent. The the fire, the the passion, and the way Cronenworth plays. Like he looks like he cares so much every time he plays. And don't get me wrong, he has not been like phenomenal or anything. But the fact that he's hitting the way he is right now, I know that it's first base, and that without the defense to be able to help out a bit, you know what I mean, and help his stats because he's a much better defensive. A second baseman, I understand that, but just in a vacuum, just as a hitter, he has been excellent. Um, you could argue that I should have put him at A because you need to weigh his offensive output with other first basemen, but for now, I'm not going to because he's looked just so damn good, guys. Like, he looks absolutely phenomenal, and he deserves so, so, so much credit because this Padres team needed him. That's another thing aside from the stats. They batted him third. Right. And especially after the loss of Soto to bat him third to say, we have confidence in you that you could be good here. He's absolutely excelled. And that's what's happened here. So, again, the fact that he's all the way up there in hard hit rate, the fact that his weighted on base and expected weighted on base suggests that he's been unlucky. The fact that he's hit for some power, the fact that he's played good defense, the fact that he's doing it at the top of this lineup. Because could you imagine what he what it would be like if he wasn't hitting right now and he's the third batter? We're already seeing what it's like with Manny Machado and Xander Bogarts being inconsistent. Imagine if Jake Cronenworth was hitting the way he was last year and, frankly, even the year before. It would look a lot different and we'd be a lot more concerned. But so far, Jake Cronenworth, A+. plus. You, sir, get to go whatever university you want. I'm just talking academic speak for the bit. Whatever university, full-ride scholarship, that's how good Jake Cronenworth has been this year. And I know that I got a little bit excited last year about Trent Grisham's start. But Trent Grisham, my thing was, I think he's showing signs that he could be average offensively. But that, of course, eventually went away very quickly. I don't think this is going away. I think that this really might be legit. I could be wrong, and people might bring up that I was wrong about Grisham bouncing back uh, last year. But I just think he looks really, really sharp. The barrels, the hard hit, the defense, the even some of his base running. He's just hitting, and he's hitting the clutch. That at-bat in the comeback is the best single at bat that the Padres have had this year. The Tatis home run was great. Heck, the Machado home run against the Dodgers to seal the game was great. But to foul off that many pitches, even after you just saw that you just missed a home run and how dejected you could feel after that, for him to come back, foul off pitch after pitch, not swing at bad pitches, and then hit a two-run home run that starts the rally, 
says a lot. Jake Cronenworth has done everything and deserves all the praise in the, Lord, in the world. And frankly, I don't think a lot of people are talking about it in general baseball circles. So shouts to Jake Cronenworth. You rule. But ladies and gentlemen, not everyone has been as good as Jake Cronenworth, but there's still been a lot of positives. And we're going to talk about those guys and then, of course, get into some of the negatives later on in just a second. But before we do that, Folks, before we do that, we got to take a second to talk about our good friends over at Prize Picks. It is the number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. You just have to pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Look, spring training's on there. You know, it's it's over. It's been over. You know what I mean? We're, we're two weeks into the season, guys. And let me tell you, whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, not foul tips, but you can do pretty much everything when it comes to this, guys. And you need to check out Prize Picks and get your entries in today. Get on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during also basketball's postseason. Playoffs begin April 20th, and the play-in rounds are April 16th, 17th, and 19th. So look forward to that. And another thing that's really cool about Prize Picks is that they offer some injury insurance. So if your player registers two plate appearances or less, Price Picks will have your back and not count that as a loss, which is really, really cool. So, hey, you could turn $10 into $100 with just a few just a few taps of the phone, folks. You know what I mean? When you press in a touch screen, that's what that happens, right? Uh, quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Price Picks the number one fantasy sports app. And because you're listening to this podcast, I got a treat for you. Download the app today and use code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Easy to remember, just go locked on MLB. It is uh, just download the app and use that code for the $100 deposit. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. And just like that, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I forgot the ad locator transition. I've been using that lately. I, I, I really enjoyed using that. My apologies, folks. Sorry about that. A little bit weird. But anyway, um, back here on the podcast, guys, we just gave Jay Cronenworth an A+. I was just absolutely i'm in love with the man what can i say you know what i mean <laughs> what can i say he's just been so so fantastic so far the next player that we're going to talk about are two players that i think fit the a tier uh for the padres and i think that i think that a lot of people will be a little bit disappointed but you have to remember that it has been a little bit inflated by what he did this week and that is fernando tatis jr he gets an a for me so far um the reason he gets an A for me is mostly because he's just back in terms of the peripherals, not necessarily the production. Don't get me wrong. He has been pretty good so far. 131 WRC plus is nothing to uh, laugh about. 263, 333, 491 slash line. He's been good there. Um, the defense, he's had a couple hiccups, right? But I think that they've been hiccups. Like he dropped a wide, like a ball in the outfield that like hit his glove. That's not good. You know what I mean? So I know that his outs above average is zero right now. Don't get me wrong, but I don't, I don't see it now. The arm, the defensive stuff with him to me has been a little bit flukier than not, and we'll talk about fluky defense in a little bit, by the way. So, again, I'm not freaking out too much about that, but for me, it's the fact that one, he's cut down on his strikeout rate very impressively, to the point where I actually don't know if this is going to fully continue, but if it does, oh my god. But as of right now, his max exit velocity is up by three miles per hour this year. His strikeout rate, like I said, down 10 percent from last year, and last year he had a, a decrease in strikeout rate too. The problem is that his walk rate that went down a little bit, and he wasn't hitting the ball as hard. But so far through the year, so far uh, through the year, his hardest hit ball last year was 113.4 miles per hour. And so far through the season, he's exceeded that. That top mark, his top hardest hit ball last year, he's already exceeded that twice. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, Right. And even his single in Korea, now I'm reading from Nick Lee, by the way, at East Village Times, his 116.7 miles per hour single in Korea against the Dodgers was the hardest hit ball of his career. So the fact that you're seeing the hard hit rate go up. And yes, if you're wondering, last year, one of the reasons people were excited about Tatis, a little bit of discrepancy between his weighted on base and expected weighted on base. Guess what? That's still the case here. 364 weighted and then expected weighted at 390. So he has been getting a little bit unlucky. Right. I know that the hard hit stuff has gone down, but that's just a little bit of an average. I am. That's one of the reasons he's just an A right now is because that has gone down by five percent. But he just looks so much better. Um, but he has not done it in times when the Padres have always needed it, which is why he's just an A for now. In fact, you could make the argument that he's an A minus actually might make that a, an argument that he's an A minus just because a lot of it was the Monday comeback and a little bit more garbage time, like the two home runs that he hit um, against, I believe, 
who was it? The Giants, I believe, when they were already down by like six. The two solo shots were incredible, but even still, it kind of came in garbage time. So Tatis has been still really, really good so far, and I think that the overall numbers have shown that he's improving, and he's back to the MVP form that he could be. And I do think that the defensive miscues have been more fluky than just a sign that, oh, no, is he actually not going to be a good defender? I think he'll be fine. Um, the other player, though, that gets an A, and this is an unequivocal A, that is Jackson Merrill. Um, this guy, I honestly can sum this up by saying, what else, what more do you want? You know what I mean? What more do you want? This is the most exciting young player that the Padres have had, like come up to the team since Tatis. 125 WRC plus on the season, but impressively 388 on base percentage, which is the third highest, I think, on the team among the players that actually like, you know, play a lot. You know what I mean? So yeah, a Zocar right now, I think has like a 470. Yeah, he's got a 417 on base, but he's only had 13 plate appearances. So, you know, um, and I think that with him, with Merrill, has looked pretty comfortable, but for me, it's the contact rates and it's the walk rate. 14.3% walk rate is offsetting a tiny, tiny bit high 20.4 strikeout percentage. He's hitting the ball pretty decently hard. He looks sharp, and he's had so many times when he swings at bad pitches. Uh, he's in the 12th percentile in chase rate, so he has to improve on that. But he's just been solid all the way around. He's played a pretty good center field. Hasn't made any like giant catches or anything like that, but there hasn't been moments where I'm like, uh-oh. I miss Grisham. That hasn't happened at all, and that's kind of the only bar he needs to pass. It's exciting. And the kid's just 20 years old, so he gets an A so far for the season. But the last a rank player that I want to hand out is our boy, the Vibe King, ladies and gentlemen. you got to give credit to the Vibe King, and that is Jerickson Profar. Fantastic start to the season. He currently <laughs> leads the Padres. He's tied for the lead with the Padres with uh, 0.6 F4 along with Jake Cronenworth. The reason I give him an A- is because Profar has gotten pretty lucky, or at least in a way that's worth bringing out. The reason why he's still an A minus though, is because it's like, whatever, I kind of don't care about that because his role was so small and he was only supposed to be this like bench player that you got for a million bucks that I kind of don't care about that. But it is still worth bringing up that it's not like the hard hit rate is going to continue at 50%, right? That's how good he's been so far. I actually, one thing I do like though, average exit velocity is up. I don't know. That might be good. If there's one thing Profar has shown is that he might at least very minimum be better than what he was last year. Can he be that player that he was with the Padres when he was good for about 2.6 F4 um, in 2022? It's not impossible. And if he can reach that, which I think the early signs have shown, that's why he gets an A minus. But it's also worth bringing up weighted on bases at 444 right now, which is really, really high in top 6% of the league. His expected weighted on base is 327. So he has gotten a little bit lucky. He's had the bad bit help him out a little bit. But the timely hitting combined with what his role is, is why I give him an A minus so far. But just expect this is not a revelation thing where he's going to become one of the best players on the team. I imagine it's going to go down for him. But. And also, also worth pointing out that, you know, not necessarily the best defensive player, right? Not necessarily the best defensive player, and that's why you've seen Jose Zocar sub in for him. So he's been very good. He's had some really solid hits for the team. The grand slam that basically won them that game against San Francisco, the two-run homer that he hit the other day, he's looked really solid, but a little bit lucky. So that's the only reason he's an A-minus for now. And then moving on into the B lane, ladies and gentlemen, that is... With a B, not a B plus, Luis Campizano. And you might be wondering, Javi, hold on a second. You're literally the leading president. You're the president of the Campizano fan club. You started the hive. You've been yelling about this guy for a year. You're only giving him a B? But Javi, uh, he's got a, a, a 119 WRC plus, which is the seventh best among all qualified catchers. What, what, what the heck's wrong with you? He's currently hitting 319 with a 333 on base and 447 slug. So it's twofold. It's a couple things for me. Number one is that I don't love that he's his like walk and strikeout rates just seem a little bit unsustainable. He's got a 2.1% walk rate, which is obviously very bad, and only a 6.3% strikeout rate. So he's kind of just hitting everything that goes his way, and it's amounted to hits. And I still think that he's an above average offensive ca uh, catcher. I really, really do. I don't think that's changing. But it does show that he's been a little bit lucky in some ways. But I still got to give him credit because he has been much better. Like, he's driven in some runs. He's got 10 RBIs on the season, which is pretty solid. Like, he's been able to come through, even if it is a little bit lucky, similar to Jerickson Profar. For me, 
oh, well, Javi, you just you said Profar had a – it's not like he was – this team is relying on him. Yeah, well, campizano has got a little bit of a bigger role. He is the starting catcher and is supposed to be a bigger part of this team. And one of the issues with him is, on top of the fact that, like I said, um, he's he's got a little bit of a, 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 a thing going with the fact that he's his walk and strikeout rates just don't seem sustainable. Like, it, you could just hit every ball. You know what I mean? Like, at some point, he needs to draw a walk. His defense is really raising some concerns. Um, I think the fact that it hasn't improved basically at all in the early going, the framing love scrub. I've talked about yesterday's show that I think that um, they might want to consider when a pitcher like Dylan Cease, who can be a little bit wild and may, might rely on because he walks so many more people, might rely on the fact that he needs a little bit of help there You know, with a better defensive catcher. That's important to bring up, especially for this pitching staff. Uh, minus four blocks above average in terms of his totality, his framing. He's in the 16th percentile. The defensive numbers are bad for him so far. And again, I don't think that a, I don't think that a 6.3 percent strikeout rate. Like that's way, way, way too low for me. The weighted on base and expected weighted on base differences aren't crazy. 345 versus 321, but even still, it's still worth bringing up. He his average exit velocity has been down. By four, um, four miles per hour, which isn't great, and that's worth bringing up. Um, max exit velocity is there, but in terms of overall stuff, his hard hit rate is down. So combine the hard hit with the exit velocity and the fact that he's just not walking at all in that six point three percent strikeout rate. I don't think is sustainable. I don't. I don't think this guy's Tony Gwynn, right? Like I just don't think that that's the case here. But. Um, you have to take that in, which means that some regression is due. And if there's some regression coming, which still will be fine, he will be an above-average offensive catcher. But if that regression hits and you're being this poor defensively and there's been no signs of an improvement, that's a problem. And it's something that's going to be a big issue with the Padres. And again, yes, I am the leader of the Hive, but one of the reasons I started the Hive was because I thought it was absurd that Nola was getting time over him. And I hate that the Padres do this thing with not giving their young players a chance. I just don't understand. With journeymen, players who aren't necessarily all that impressive, so... That's that. But speaking of not letting players play, and speaking of some journeyman players, we've got some more folks to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. We're still in the B territory, though, so it's not going to get too bad. But we're going to finish this out with a little bit more negative. So prepare yourself for that, ladies and gentlemen. I won't be, like, as negative as I was on Monday's show, right, when I, like, almost lost my mind. But it's not going to be great. We'll get into that in just a second, though, guys. First, I want to talk to you about eBay. We love eBay, ladies and gentlemen. It's fantastic. Don't you love it? You know why I like eBay? Because eBay Motors has got you covered, even if you know nothing about cars. And I mean nothing. Uh, the only thing I know about cars is everything I see from Fast and Furious, and then whenever I'm in a vehicle and I'm like, that's the steering wheel, that's all I know. Well, guess what? eBay Motors, they know a little bit more. Passion, drive, and patience, that's the formula for winning championships, and it's the same for your ride-or-die vehicle. And here's the thing. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, carpet, and much more. They got you covered whether you're into speed, power, or style. With over 102 million parts for your vehicle, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, they kind of, you know, you put your ride in, they'll show you the check marks and stuff, and then you'll be good to go. So don't worry about like being a doofus like me saying, I, I don't know how cars work. What is this? I thought everything's just get me engine. You know what I mean? <laughs> Does it, doesn't that cover everything? No, don't worry. They have you covered on that stuff too. You're burning rubber, not cash with eBay Motors. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only. Available to U.S. customers. Go check it out. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we're back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast, finishing up this report card. See, this is why I had to split it into two parts, because I talk too much, man. I talk way too much. Let's keep going, though. B minuses for the season are two players that are basically been defensive uh, replacements in a lot of they're both literally defensive replacements. And that's Jose Azokar and Kyle Higashioka. I really think that Azokar is showing why already I thought it was really lame that they just never gave him playing time. Um, he has graded as a pretty solid defender before this um, last year, which is one of the reasons why I was interested in giving him some more at bats because my thing was like, let's just try it. You know what I mean? Let's just try it because Grisham is just horrific when it comes to the rest of the stuff, right? In terms of his defense so far, he hasn't looked exceptional, but if you go like on Baseball Savant, for example, he's kind of like unqualified for them to give you like sliders and percentile rankings. But in terms of everything like, you know, Strikeout rate isn't great. I do like that he's increased his walk rate. 
that's good. That's very, very good. I like that he's increased his walk rate. That's really important. Um, I don't think that he's going to be a plus offensive player. But just so far through the season, for what your role is, he's got a 128 WRC plus, 0.1 F4 across 13 plate appearances, and he's been a defensive replacement basically only. It is frustrating that, yeah, this guy just has no pop whatsoever, zero isolated power. It's not going to happen, right? That's not going to be something that he's good with. But I think that considering what his role is, I think he's been fine. And honestly, I need a little bit more before I give like a full ranking on him because he just hasn't played all that much. You know what I mean? And especially early on in the season when you have less sample size for even the starters to give grades on. That's why I'm landing on a B plus for now. You could argue C plus um, because of the fact that, like I said, he's just not heading for any power. And the fact that his weighted on base and expected weighted on base is really off. But I like that he's increased his walk rate. And I like that at the very minimum for what he's contributed for this very moment. He has a decent slash line at two. What is he hitting right now? Let's see if I can find it. Uh, 364, 417 on base, 364 slugging. Again, that's fine. If he can just be 103 WRC plus, that would be such a huge W for this team. And I don't think that's impossible. I think it's unlikely, but I don't think it's impossible. And at the very minimum, if you get like a 94 WRC plus from this guy and he's just as good as Trent Grisham defensively, you just have Trent Grisham as a backup, and then you have Jackson Merrill leading the center field. So that's this stuff adds up. So not the most thrilling stuff. I don't think this is a high upside player or anything like that, but I do like that um, he's gotten a little bit more playing time. And by the way, I think it says a lot that his playing time share has made more sense this year, and it's when there's been a stud in center field with Merrill. But when, when Grisham was there hitting under 200 for three straight years, that was like he would never get playing time there. So I don't, I just don't understand that. I don't understand that. At least Merrill, it's like, yeah, this is why we're not giving Zokar too many more at bats because Merrill's been so good to start. So I imagine though, we'll see as time um, goes on. Uh, the next one's Kyle Higashioka with a B minus, doing exactly what he, his role has um, needed, and also had that one game where he threw out two runners and he hit the basically the go ahead game winning home run. Great backup catcher. Can't emphasize that enough. His defense is good as evidenced by that and with the framing. I think he deserves to start a, when when Dylan Cease is pitching. That's where I'm right, where I'm at right now. If Campy's out, I can't improve his defense. I just want to start with Cease because he could be a little bit wild with some of his pitches. I want a really solid defensive catcher behind the plate there, but that's just me. Um, speaking of defense, though, C plus territory, folks. I know, I know you hate to hear it. I know, I know, but it's our boy Hassan Kim. No, I am not taking a victory lap and saying, "Wow, I told y'all they should have traded him." You know what I mean? I will say in the early going so far, this hasn't been necessarily all luck-based. The weighted on base stuff isn't there. But in terms of BABIP, considering that he's a fast player, Hassan Kim's only got a 256 BABIP, which is quite low. Um, and he's a speedy guy. So that's my thing. Um, I think that that'll go up. I think his career is at 286. So there's a little bit of luck progression to come his way there. Um, he hasn't looked great there. He's made three errors so far there in the season, and he only made four all of last year. So that's why I give him a C plus. Um, and also, though, the reason why he's not lower is because I think he's slowly tapping into it. I think we saw that a little bit this series with the triples and whatnot that he hit two. I think he hit two triples in the series. I forgot it was two or one triple. I forgot. But I think he's slowly coming alive. And most importantly, though, all the defensive metrics are still there. 97th percentile and outs above average. He's still got the sprint speed. He's not whiffing at too many pitches. It'll come. It'll come. And in fact, he actually has a better hard hit rate this year. 36.4% compared to last year at 26.7. And his average exit velocity is up. So I think that the offense is coming. I really do. And with the um, defense showing that he's still got some um, range and all that stuff is still there, he's a C-plus for now. Um, I just think that you have to downgrade him a little bit because expected stats are one thing and bottom line is he just hasn't produced enough. So that's just for now. I think that's going to go way up. I'm very confident that Hassan Kim will get much better. Um, now we get into some of the uh, numbers, and that's a C-. minus. And there's two players I want to give this to. Number one is Tyler Wade because Tyler Wade, at the very minimum, does deserve credit that he started off the season pretty good. He's got some speed on the bat. And actually, there was a couple times when I was like, you know what? You did get a little bit unlucky with some of those strike three calls. Um, but in terms of all everything else, he's at least drawing walks. He's fast. Good bench player. He's doing what he can. Um, but his spike, his uh, strikeout rate has actually gone up a little bit. But I like that he's drawn some walks. Again, for what his role is supposed to be, my issues with Tyler Wade have nothing to do with him as a player, basically. He, he, I would argue he shouldn't be starting. And we're going to get into that in a second when we get into the F grade for a couple players. But 
Shouts to Tyler Wade. Not that bad, but still. And then Eggy Rosario. I mentioned that his WRC plus is really high. It's the highest on the team, but that's only across 17 plate appearances. And the problem with him is twofold. Number one, he's been bad in a couple of really clutch, important situations. And number two, his lefty righty split is insane right now. In terms of his career, and granted, it's a small sample size. That's why it's this ridiculous. But in terms of his career, he has a 307 WRC plus against lefties and a 22 WRC plus against righties. And overall, he's got a 40% K rate. So the offense has been tricky. But the reason why I don't give him like a D or anything like that is because in fairness, he has done well against lefties. And two, they just don't give him consistent playing time and they've been starting Tyler Wade over him. And I don't understand that. I don't know why every day or every time there's been a lefty, they've started him. Or frankly, just go back and forth. Or frankly, keep Graham Pauly on the team. Talked about this yesterday. So that's frustrating. But um, I just think it's hard for me to kill a guy who's only being brought up in really tough situations to produce. I don't understand why you don't just give him a little bit more playing time when we don't know what he's capable of at the major league level yet. Oh, well, Javi, the coaches know something. Yeah, well, hmm. This is also the same organization that's traded like Yasmani Grandal before because they knew something. And I just don't, you know, I, I'm not vibing with that. I'm not saying that this guy's like, you know, an all-star and, and hiding in the wings that we won't use. But I don't trust this organization and management to know who deserves a shot and who doesn't because they promoted CJ Abrams way too quickly. They quit on Kim basically by doing that until they were forced to start him more. They promoted um, Luis Campuzano and used him poorly. So that's my thing. They haven't earned the benefit of the doubt when it comes to playing time with players, at least in my opinion. So Eggy Rosario, some really bad numbers. I like that you're hitting lefties, but bad in the clutch strikeout rates too high, but I do give you a break because you've had inconsistent playing time. Now for the last three. D plus for Manny Machado. He has a less F war. He has less F war than Tyler Wade, Kyle Higashioka, and Jose Azokar. Now, a big part of that is because Manny Machado has not been playing defense. But even still, everything about this guy has looked horrendous so far. None of the hard hit rate stuff is up. Basically nothing. His max exit velocity is down. His uh, average exit velocity is down. His strikeout rate actually up this year to 23.1%, which is the highest it's been. Dare I say it is the highest it's been since 2022, and I think the highest of his career? Hold on, am I getting this right? Is this the highest strikeout rate for Manny Machado's career right now? Hold on, give me one second, guys. It won't. Baseball Savant doesn't pull back all the way. Um, Highest strikeout rate of his... This is the highest strikeout rate currently of his career. He looks horrible, um, frankly. He looks really, really bad at the plate. Doesn't look comfortable. He's been getting some hits lately. He's been getting some. And it is important, like I said, the war thing is because he's not playing defense, and that's a big part of this, but... He's looked really bad. The weighted on base, expected weighted on base isn't kind to him either. It's not like he's got expected stats that say he's going to be better. His expected slugging is still really low. He's looked horrendous. Combo that with the strikeout rate. Just really bad stuff. And especially when you would think that now that he can just focus on hitting and maybe bounce back to what he was a couple years ago from the really bad season last year, hasn't done that. So it's a, it's a D plus for me. The only reason it's not an F for me and the only reason, frankly, that's not a D minus or anything like that is because go check out the article in the athletic. It has been hinted at that. He's still kind of getting back from this injury and he's not at hundred percent. So that might explain why he's so messy. And if one of the reasons we were confident in him bouncing back this year is because he wouldn't have the injury thing to worry about, then I think it's fair to still say, okay, this doesn't seem like this is the full him, but he still gets a D plus because bottom line is the results have not been there, even if there is reasons for it. So that's my thing on Machado. I am optimistic, optimistic because it's been so bad that it has to get better, right? You know what I mean? Like he's been so bad in this regard that I think that it has to get better. I don't think this is going to be a guy who finishes with a 90 WRC plus. That would be insane. Even if he does have some injury stuff, even last year, 114, right? So hopefully he gets better, but it is frustrating that he might still be hurt. Lastly, though, there are two Fs. Number one. It goes to Graham Pauly, and it is not his part fault. I'm not grading him as a player. I'm grading the fact that they used him horribly, and I think that it's really stupid that you have Tyler Wade starting over him when it should be Pauly, Eggy Rosario. Platooning a bit, probably more so Pauly because he doesn't have as much of a split um, issue. Put him at third base. Try him out more. What are we doing with Tyler Wade? It's already going down. Jerks and Profar would be a good example. Let's say we had Graham Pauly was a left fielder. That would make sense, and being like, 
Okay, yeah, Profar is, might be getting a little bit lucky right now, but hey, bottom line is he's producing, so we're going to keep him in. Tyler Wade, it's already going down. And what did they do? Sent Grand Pauly down. They're still ba barely playing Eggy Rosario, aside from pitch hitting situations, when he's flashed some good stuff with the leather. I, not going to get into that. So it's an F for Grand Pauly, but it's more not him as a player, but the situation is what I'm giving an F. But the actual other F for a player so far, he's the one I haven't talked about yet. It is Xander Bogarts. He has an F on the season, basically for all the reasons that I mentioned for Machado. But the difference is, allegedly, does not have an issue with the wrist anymore. That is one of the reasons I was excited about him. Coming into this year, do not let the one home run prove, um, fool you. Average exit velocity is in the bottom 7th percentile of the league. It is down 4% last year. From last year, I should say. I don't care if his expected batting average is up. Okay, so a couple grounders haven't gone his way. Fine, fine, fine. Whatever. But his weighted on base, yeah, there's some room to grow here. But my issue here is this. You don't have an injury designation. It's not like you got hit with the Spencer Strider fastball two days ago. And that's why he hasn't been performing. 10.9% K rate is very good. But to me, that's been a product more of him just not looking comfortable swinging. You know what I mean? It does not seem like he's getting super unlucky. The launch angle, for God's sake, is down. The barrel rate percentage is down. Like, everything on this guy... Or, I'm sorry, the launch angle is actually... Oh, I'm sorry. His launch angle is up. 13.3%, which is the highest since 2019. So maybe that's some hope for excitement, but bigger thing is this. I don't care about the launch angle if your hard hit rate, 34.6% last year, 25% this year. That is awful. Awful. And another thing that happened last year, his ground ball percentage uh, was 49.8%. This year, it's 50%. It, and Fangraphs had it at 50% too. So that hasn't improved. So you're still hitting the ball on the ground, and your hard hit stuff is going down even lower, and you don't have any um, wrist issue, at least at the moment, to potentially explain why you're not hitting the ball as hard. So that's really, really bad, guys. Really, really bad. And I'm very concerned about Bogarts for your hard hit rate to go down two years in a row. I know it's early. Hey, early report card. What can I do? But that's concerning. So that's why Xander Bogarts gets an F for the season so far. He's been okay at second, but not all that impressive. So that can't offset it either. And again, like I said with Machado, if he was playing third right now, he'd probably at least be able to give you some value with his glove. And because he's also hurt, that's why he was a little bit of. Xander Bogarts ain't doing that. And I'm concerned, guys. I'm really concerned. Um, I just don't think that there's any excuses. Hopefully he gets back to it. I think he's been so bad that it has to go up similar to Machado. But as of just what we've seen so far, it's an F for Xander Bogarts. Final grades, ladies and gentlemen. An A-plus for Jay Cronenworth. An A for Fernando Tatis Jr. and Jackson Merrill. An A-minus for Jerickson Profar. A B for Luis Campizano. A B-minus for Jose Ozocar and Kyle Higashioka. A C-minus for Eggy Rosario and Tyler Wade. A D-plus for Manny Machado. And Oh, I'm sorry. And then a um, what's it? C plus for Hassan Kim, and then D plus for Manny Machado, and then an F for how they handled the Grand Pauly situation, and then Xander Bogarts. Those are my final grades, folks. What do you think? Let me know. Go ahead. Type in the comments. Go ahead. Type in the comments. I dare you. I triple dog dare you. And of course, everybody, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast. The only pod. That may be better than the pot Jerry's themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Leave all your questions at the at handle in the YouTube comments. Monday episode's coming up, so feel free to leave your comments about anything, by the way. I don't care what you ask me. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be baseball, and I'll still answer it. That's how crazy I am. So go check that out, guys. Tomorrow's episode, we are doing the same thing except for pitchers. So look forward to that. Until next time, stay safe, and of course, stay faithful, my fire faithful homies. Take care.